And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dr. and President Sandy Shugart. A truly, truly interesting, engaging, intriguing individual, and complex individual. I talked earlier about the reason we chose the theme for today. Well, coupled with that is the reason we chose the keynote speaker, because we think he will help to bring some synergy to those things that I already spoke about and, and all the reasons why the work we do is so important. Every one of you, every one of you sitting out there. But Dr. Shugart has so many facets to him. You know, for, for most of his life, he's been a singer, songwriter, performer, entertainer, poet, and probably could have gone on and, and just done that. But then somewhere along the way, he also became a college president and still continues to do these other things. And he's going to weave a number of these things into his presentation this morning. And you may wonder, how did he get into education and become a college president if he had all these other things going on? And I recently learned a little story behind that, a true story. And that is that he was, when he was dating his current wife, Jane, he did the noble thing back many years ago and asked her father for her hand in marriage. And her father asked him at one point, hmm, and how do you intend to support the two of you and a family? And he said, well, with my poetry. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go over <laughs> as well as he had hoped. And so he said he did a little thinking and decided, you know what, maybe I need to do something else in addition to that. So he went back to school to get a, uh, a degree in education and ultimately got in, became a teacher and got in the world of education. And he said and the reason was so he could get married. So we all have reasons, some of them more noble than others, as to why we get into this field. Sandy has his own particular reason why he gets into this field. And based on his 36 years successful marriage and what he has done for higher education and for student success, I'd say that was a good choice. So without further ado, let me introduce to you the very intriguing Dr. and President Sandy Shugart. I couldn't help imagining that later today the, the WAGs and the faculty office will be thinking about that uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary quip and saying, I hope they sing Blowing in the Wind. That's how I found out that my aunt and I finally did what we had all been talking about. And when we got the message, it came as no great surprise. But where one heart attack would do most people, with Anna it took five. Well, she would kick up her heels down on Michigan Avenue. They would dance all night. Ourselves, Anna says that we're all right. Well, Anna was my grandma's sister, which made her a great aunt to me. I guess most folks just have two grandmothers. It always felt like I had three. She could tell your horoscope once she read my palm. Well, something's coming up in September. She was hardly ever wrong. Well, she would kick up her heels down on Michigan Avenue. They would dance all night. And if ever we were doubting ourselves, 
Anna says that we're all right. Anna worked at the World's Fair in Chicago and the Merchandise Mart, too. And lots of guys asked Anna out. She even married, too. Well, the first was a little too fond of his mother, so that just didn't work out. But the second one was an entrepreneur, and that one knew what love was about. Well, they would kick up their heels down on Michigan Avenue, and they would Anna made him feel all right Well, Anna knew lots of stories Cause she had been around And Anna knew Life's much too wonderful to live it sitting down And you must take some chances, she said That's what I would tell you Cause if you're too afraid of the sorrow You'll miss the happiness too Now I'm sure you're gonna miss her Now that she's taken that ride But I guess I'll always be carrying my Aunt Anna in yeah, I guess I'll always be carrying my Aunt Anna inside. Now she would kick up her heels down on Michigan Avenue, and they would dance all night. And if ever we were doubting ourselves, Anna says that we're all right. Now we can kick up our heels down on Michigan Avenue, and we can dance all night. says that we're all right and Anna says that we're all right Thank you. What is this guy doing? So, um, I like the comment John made a few minutes ago about our avocation and our vocation being the same. Because that was the beginning, really, of um, all of my work. When I was 17, I read a poem uh, by Robert Frost, but not that one. It's, um, it's called Two Tramps at Mud Time. Who knows that poem? Anybody? It's a great poem. I recommend it. And uh, the poem is about uh, him being, Robert Frost, being up in the Berkshires. Ellen? And he's writing his poems. And he's been writing up there for a while. It's winter time. You know, he wrote a lot of winter poems. And he's been writing and writing and writing. That's his work until he's just sick of it. Do you ever feel that way? It's your work, you love it, but sometimes you're just sick of it. You need a break. So he needed a break, and he went out to chop some wood, which was uncharacteristic for him because he wasn't a real outdoorsy guy. So he's out there chopping wood in the winter time, And he's doing it, he's stuck there doing that because it's mud time. You guys would know what mud time is. I have to explain it in the South. You know, when the, 
when the thaw comes a little early and the dirt roads all turn to a quagmire and wagon wheels wouldn't traverse it. So wherever you were, he had to just stay in mud time. So he's really feeling stuck. So he's out there chopping wood and he's not very good at it. And while he's doing that, two hobos who probably slept in his barn last night wander out into the road. And in the poem, he imagines a conversation with them where they are uh, making fun of him for being a bad wood chopper and uh, uh, saying things like, uh, you should let us do that, we're professionals, that's how we earn our breakfast. And then he rebels in the poem and says, no, no, I need to do this. This is my work too. And in the last stanza of the poem, he says this, but yield who will to their separation. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation. Yield who will to their separation. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation as my two eyes make one in sight. For only when love and need are one and work is play for mortal stakes is a deed ever really done for heaven or the future's sake. Love and need, avocation and vocation, duty and joy, that sort of um, amalgam of what it means to be joyfully responsible in the world. You know? I heard that at 17 and I thought, I don't ever want to live any other way. I don't want to, to have a work role in life, in a, in a home life, and a life with friends, and a life in art and you know, music, and all those lives separate and um, siloed. I don't, want, I don't want to be a different person, depending on who's in the room. Um, and I don't want to, to uh, smother some gifts because this isn't the right place for them. Do you understand what I'm saying? To, to live a life where you're all for yourself all of the time is the goal I, I had then and still have. I'm still a long way from doing it. But if you wonder what I'm doing up here, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. So it's to be the same all the time. And some of what I'm going to talk to you about, there is content. I hope, I hope we get to it. <laughs> I feel like uh, with the weather here, having come from Orlando, I owe you a tropical song. A little sunshine in your life. You know this song. You, if you know the bass line, you can say it. Boom. That's what you said on the internet. The words you spoke were so swell. I fell in love with you, even though you couldn't spell. On the internet, two thousand miles apart. On the internet, I downloaded your heart. On the internet, we were filled with desire. On the internet. My mouse was on fire in the internet, the internet. I think I better stop there. <laughs> Sorry. Does that feel like sunshine? House is the volume of the guitar okay? So I was telling some of my friends last night that I have never been more hopeful for the work we do than I am right now. I've been doing this for 33 years. 34 years now. There goes another one. And I'll tell you why I'm hopeful in a minute, but I'm tremendously hopeful for the future of what we do, the mission we have, the people we serve, and the long-term health of our institutions and our place at the table. And it's been a long journey. Um, 
And I find that having that metaphor that we're on a kind of a journey together helps me think about this work. So as I share some content with you in a few minutes, please understand it to be just one fellow traveler on the road with you comparing notes. That's all we're doing. But I find it a hopeful metaphor because when you're on a journey, it's... Uh, it gives you a sense of agency. We're going somewhere. We're doing something. We run into obstacles, but it's not just stuff happening to us. It's stuff we're going through to get somewhere. And this got real clear to me 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, when we had three hurricanes in six weeks in Orlando. We hadn't had a hurricane in 37 years. Everybody said they never hit here. They always turn away and hit, I don't know, Alabama or somebody. So I was actually on the road uh, doing a singing gig in Alabama when the Hurricane Charlie, the first of the three, was coming. My wife called me and said, you think you better get home? And I said, oh, they always turn away. Don't worry about it. Hadn't been a hurricane in 37 years. She said, oh, okay. So I did the gig and I went to back to the room and I spent the night and I got up the next morning and turned on the weather and it was quite clear this one wasn't turning away. So I called the airport to get an earlier flight and they laughed at me and said, the airport's closed in Orlando, you idiot. I said, that would make sense. I had a little rental car and I jumped in the rental car and drove from Birmingham, Alabama to Orlando in record time. I wouldn't believe how fast I went because Everybody else was going the other way. There was no, tra <laughs> no traffic going my way, and the police were helping them do it. So as I blew by, they just shook their head. I got there, got home about 6 o'clock that night, and the hurricane was about two hours away. So as I came over the crest of the hill, there's only one in Orlando, came over the crest of the hill, and could see down towards Tampa this wall of blackness coming we went to the, Jane was already ready. We have four kids and a dog and a mother-in-law and all these other folks living with. She had the house ready. We had gallons of water and pillows and things stuffed into hallways where they'd be safe. She was ready. And uh, so I decided I'd get ready. I got a cigar and a glass of scotch and went out back to sit and watch it come in because weather is really fascinating. And the dog and I watched it. And uh, I had checked the weather and and the weather, you know, I don't know why they do this. They uh, personalize physics, don't they? Charlie bears down on Central Florida. Uh, Charlie wreaks havoc on Tampa like, like it was a person instead of just physics. And has some kind of malevolent will. Charlie didn't like us. I think maybe it makes us feel like we can reason with it or something. I'm not sure. So anyway, the hurricane really hit about 10, 10.30. We had 110 mile an hour winds. I'm sitting on the back porch and we've got this cage that goes over the swimming pool, which you have to have in Florida to keep the mosquitoes from carrying the children away. And, and, uh, and, and I sat there and watched this thing. It was unbelievable. Lightning and crazy wind and stuff flying by. And, um, and then we got to the eye of the hurricane. I'd never been through that before. And it did, it calmed down. Winds went down to about 10 or 15 miles an hour. You could look up and see stars straight above you. And in the wall of the eye, you could see crazy stuff happening. Like uh, sometimes you'd see lightning. Other times you'd see these big green flashes, which I learned later were, were uh, those electrical boxes blowing up on the, on the power poles, whatever. Then the back of the, of the wall hit us, and that's the strongest winds. And when it did, we had a downdraft. I didn't know wind could do this. We had a downdraft, probably 120 or 30 mile an hour downdraft. It just pushed the house down like that, mushed us. You could feel it. your ears are popping. The water in the pool made a bowl like this. And, and the screen enclosure went like a giant had just stepped on it. And the dog said, must go in. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> Now, Charlie was a fast-moving hurricane. He was gone by two. It's all over with. It's real dark out. I didn't sleep much. And I expected the next morning to get up to, you know, havoc 
and depression and all that stuff. Got up real early, went out before sunrise, and sure enough, all the big trees were down, and we were trapped in the neighborhood, and I knew it was going to be a long day, because um, being a Texan originally, I had three or four chainsaws, and those Florida boys had chainsaws. You can't do anything with a chainsaw in Florida. So I knew it was going to be a long day. But I sat out front with my, looking to the east with my cup of coffee in my hand and did not feel what I expected to feel. What I really felt was uh, hope. We'd been through this thing. Um, it didn't feel like it had hit us. It felt like we had journeyed through it. And we were, we'd learned something and it, we'd all survived and, you know, the road was still ahead. It was just a very hopeful, positive thing. And, so this little song popped out in the middle of that reverie called Morning Blue. Morning Blue in the east Nothing sad, no, not in the least. The morning dew is on my shoes. Fresh beginning, got nothing to lose to the morning blue. Mm -hmm. I'm on the road now. It's a traveling day Destinations so far away But I love the walking And all the folks you meet I love the talking To strangers in the street Guess some folks were made for traveling And the goodbyes, they never come too hard some nights I wonder why I'm leaving But at daybreak, walking out the yard Here's what I mean about being hopeful. The whole country, it seems, has finally awakened to the possibility that we represent. We were off the radar for such a long time, and suddenly, in the last few years, community colleges is on the radar. We've quietly become the dominant mode of access to higher education. 
beyond any other sector. We're serving now the whole spectrum of students. And folks are waking up and saying, wow, if you want to solve the really challenging problems in our communities, most of which have something to do with loss of hope, loss of opportunity, loss of economic mobility, then these guys might be the answer. If only they could get better results. Right? If, we, if we found a way to move the needle on the performance of our students to double or potentially triple their success rates, so it sounds like a huge challenge, and it is, but if we were able to do that, I think we would own the next quarter century in higher ed. We'll own it. With all that comes with that in terms of social capital, political capital, resources, it's all just beyond our reach. If only we can move the needle on their performance. Which is not easy to do because we were not originally designed to produce learning. We were created post-World War II America to warehouse raw material and produce a product. We were built on a factory model. That's where part-time hourly labor comes from. That's where measures of productivity, that's why enrollment's usually king at most community colleges. It's all about productivity, because that's the way we were designed. We were made to be a factory. Raw material in one end, stepwise, each person does a different step on the assembly process. If the raw material makes it to the end, it's a product. If it doesn't, in the American model of manufacturing, it's called scrap. And the American model was a high scrap model, wasn't it? This is pre-Japanese manufacturing uh, innovation. That's who we were designed to be terrible model for producing powerful learning, especially among students who might not already have ever had a powerful learning experience. Really a terrible model. And it's been given to us, and here we are. Whether you're, a, whether you're an advisor or a faculty member or a dean or a president, whatever your role might be, we all inherited the same crazy box. Here we are try to figure out how to make deep, institution-wide, substantive changes to the environment that learners experience so they have a chance to succeed at a much higher level. We all have the same problem. And this is where Valencia's journey began. It was with dissatisfaction. It's a powerful thing, dissatisfaction. We decided we were not happy. We weren't happy with the results. We believed our students could do better. And we looked hard. We, I mean, we tortured the data. We spent a lot of time together talking about it and says, this is as good as they can do. And we didn't believe that was true. So it set us on a long conversation and a long road. We've been doing this work for 15 years, the same work the same set of concerns and, and the same trajectory towards student, deep student learning and student success. By the way, it's in that order. Learning comes before success. The country's a little confused about this. You've heard the completion agenda? Is that something familiar to you? Yeah? It's a good thing. Completion agenda is a good thing. But the working theory behind it is a little bit messed up. The working theory in the completion agenda is, gosh, if more students completed, that means they will have learned more and they'll be better positioned to contribute. It sounds good, but it's wrong. The right theory is, gee, if more students learned deeply, coherently, purposefully, they'll be able to contribute more and it'll be reflected in their completion. That's a subtle difference, but it's, it's an important one because it decides where you focus your attention. It's on their learning. Learning first, which was the first goal, the name of the first goal in our first strategic plan when we decided we wanted to work on this 15 years ago. First goal was learning first. We're going to put that ahead of every other value. 
How do you do that? We've been at it for 15 years, and the, the needle has moved. Our numbers are dramatically different. Our fall-to-fall -fall persistence rates today are higher than our fall-to-spring persistence rates were 15 years ago. Okay. There's no longer a gap that you can measure, a meaningful gap in the performance of students of different ethnicities in the key gateway courses that, that drive success in our college. No, no longer a change. In fact, the highest performing group is Hispanic female, but just by a little bit. I didn't think, I didn't think we'd get there, not this fast. But we're there. No, stay in there is another deal. Our graduation rates have more than doubled. And when you deconflate the data, not just at our place, but lots of places now, the pattern you see is this. Students who come to us who are prepared and ready to go to college succeed at an enormously high rate. Our college-ready students graduated about 60% as we measure it, and it's hard to measure some of the loss in that because they move, it's a mobile town, they move out of the state and we lose track of them. 60% is better than the, than the state university system. It's a good number. Those who have what we would call light remediation, that is, I used to know this, but I haven't used it in a while, and I need to recover it. We're able to, to treat them very quickly and get them on the same path, and they graduate at almost the same rate as the students who came college ready. Those who need what I'd call moderate remediation, say two areas and maybe two courses in at least of one of those areas in our developmental program, uh, we've doubled their graduation rates, so we've made progress, but there's still a gap between them and college ready students. But I think it's possible to close that gap. The 15% who come to us with deep remedial needs, we're failing with. We've doubled their graduation rate, but it's 12%. That's terrible. And I say that knowing this, that in more than half of the community colleges in America, the aggregate graduation rate is 12%. So ours is 12 for the neediest of students. What we're doing isn't working. We have to start brand new with it. We have to redesign everything for them. But we figured some of this stuff out for everybody else. So here's, what have we figured out? I want to share three big ideas and six design principles with you, quickly. Here are the three ideas. First, this, this was fundamental to our change, and I know that many of you have heard me preach on this before, I'm sorry, but it's just too important not to mention. We came to understand this fact. Anyone can learn anything under the right conditions. It doesn't mean they're all alike. It doesn't mean they all learn at the same rate. And it doesn't mean that they're all ready now. But the biological fact is students who are not learning, except in a tiny, tiny fraction of 1%, aren't learning not because there's a biological deficiency. There's some other challenge like lack of prerequisite knowledge, behavioral issues, you know, there's other issues associated with it. It's not because they can't, it's because they're not able to for other factors, and some of those are alterable variables. We talked about this, I mean, this is my area, I'm a, I'm a I guess you call me a uh, cognitive uh, neuroscientist, that's my background, it's chemistry in the brain and, and cognitive theory, the things that came together for me. And I could prove this to you with research. And I've done this before. I've killed people, death by PowerPoint, you know, 130 <laughs> slides. And I could prove it to you. Except I learned that, that evidence doesn't convince anybody. This is also part of my brain science work. Evidence doesn't change things. Your beliefs are, are not rooted in evidence. They're rooted in organic neural pathways that are hard to change. And whatever you believed when they were formed, is the evidence they were based on. Presenting new evidence now has very little impact on your real beliefs. Very little. It's, uh, just drives logical, scientific people crazy because they're subject to it too. Okay. So, um, but here's what does convince a story. This is a true story I've told a thousand times. I know some of you have heard it. 
I gave the death by PowerPoint to uh, 2,000 teachers in Texas one time. Austin, Texas. You know, anyone can learn anything. I asked them, do you believe this? And a lot of hands went up. I said, you're such liars. You don't believe this. Oh, yeah, sure we do. I said, no, you don't. 60, 70% of you in the room think that you are genetically math disabled. You believe that about yourself. You've told people, oh, I'm no good at math. You know who you are. It's most of you. Many of you have been challenged to learn another language. You say, it's too late for me. That part of my brain turned to concrete when I was 25. <laughs> or you've said to somebody, you know, I'd really like to learn to play the piano. You liar. You're not doing it because you think you can't. You can. Biologically, every one of those things can be mastered under the right conditions. So I get, finish the talk. This lady comes up to me after and says, thank you for that message, Dr. Sugar. Would you sign my book and blah, blah, blah. And she says, and by the way, I think that thing you said about anybody can learn anything under the right conditions is true for most disciplines. <laughs> I've heard this before. I said, well, what is it you teach? She said, German. It's a really hard language. It's kind of non-intuitive, got a crazy vocabulary. The syntax is odd and grammar's weird. And I can tell you after teaching German for 15 years, there's some people who just can't learn German. I said, well, how fortunate for them they weren't born in Germany. I said, you see, pretty much 100% of the Germans <laughs> master the language. Do you think that's genetic? There's a Deutsche gene. Somewhere Hitler thought that, you know, I don't think so. It just happens that the conditions for mastering German are exceptionally good in Germany. And if I gave you, oh, let's say 100 euros and dropped you in Munich and said I'll be back for you in six weeks, when I came back, you'd be reading German. You'd be speaking German. Anyone can learn anything. That's the first thing we learned that changed everything. Because now the issue isn't sorting the learners. The issue is figuring out the conditions, many of which they control. Figuring out the conditions that support their learning. And they're all a little different. That's a different task. That takes each learner as a person seriously and deals them in. How am I going to partner with you? Because you control so much of the conditions of your own learning, like showing up, doing the work. <laughs> Second thing we learned was that all the failure was at the front door. All the failures, all the high risk courses were front door courses. The first courses students encountered that had success rates that were dramatically lower than the rest of the college. You said, well, of course it is. You've weeded them out. Yeah, that's the problem. What we found when we ran our data was that the best predictor of graduation at Valencia was success on first attempt in your first five classes, no matter what they were. Developmental college level didn't matter what they were. If you took five classes, one semester, two semesters, however long it took you to do it, and you succeeded on first attempt on all five, you're going to graduate. It's like an 80% graduation rate. But if you withdraw or fail to succeed in one, the graduation rate goes down 50%. One course. And if it's two, it goes down by half again. Dramatic impact at the front door. So we knew we had to change the pattern of success at the front door. We called it start right. The third thing we learned was this. Here's how we say it. The college is what the students experience, period. It's how they experience us that counts. Not how we experience them and not how we experience one another. It's how they experience us that ought to drive every conversation about shaping the conditions of learning at our colleges. That's not easy to do. 
because colleges are deeply self-absorbed and full of constituencies. Sociologists call them refractory organizations where you have competing value systems and priorities at work in the colleges and it usually finds some kind of equilibrium which I call a balance of terror. <laughs> and then nothing can happen. And the instrument of terror is the committee. <laughs> it's just a bomb. <laughs> it's crazy. And it creates a spirit of advocacy. I'm here to speak for my group instead of what ought to be natural to us, a spirit of inquiry. I wonder what this means. I wonder how to get meaning out of these data. I wonder what if we tried something else. I wonder what others are doing. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. That's where we ought to be. And we've learned, not all the time, but most of the time, to stay there in wonder together and design around our students. So the latest example of that, and I'll finish with this in maybe a, a song or a poem. The latest example of that is a set of principles for design when we're designing the student experience. So we went to the students, and we went to our data, and we went to one another for a year and a half, almost two years, and we said, what is it our students need to be successful? What do they need? especially at the beginning of college. And we developed the six P's out of that research. The six P's, we call it. And it doesn't matter what part of the college you're in, you can influence at least five of the six P's where you are. The first is place. Do I belong here? Place. Most of our front door processes look like they were designed to alienate people. Kind of like the doctor's office on the first visit. So we've, we've thought about how to redesign all that. How do we give people a sense that you belong here? This is your place. And here are the people you can be close to. This is why learning communities work. They need to encounter it in the first term. They've got to find a place at the college. Make sure I don't miss anything. So if you look, if you look at the students and say, where do you belong? The ones who are succeeding have a place of belonging. Our highest retention and, and, and uh, graduation programs are cohort-based programs, aren't they? Look around. How many of you have ever been to, oh, uh, a dental hygiene pinning ceremony. You been to those? They belong to one another. They have a sense of place, and it started in their first class. How do you do that with everybody? Good question. Second P, purpose. As we looked uh, at what we called outliers at the time, students who shouldn't have been successful, but were. We probed and probed around that. Outliers are a good way to do research. Who is the exception to the hypothesis, the prevailing hypothesis, right? Here's the common denominator we found in all of them. They had a reason. They had a purpose here. They knew why they were at college. Their purpose might be profound. You know, I'm gonna cure cancer. Or it might be very mundane. My family fell apart, and if I don't get a better job, my children aren't going to have any opportunity. I'm compelled to be here. Or anything in between. But they had a purpose. Now, you come to college, many people, we say, to develop a purpose. You talk to our, first, our new students, they won't tell you that. What are you here for? I don't know. I'm going to college. Are you here to develop a purpose? I don't know. That's that. In hindsight, we look back and say, yes, college is a place to develop purpose, because we did. What about those who didn't make it? So discerning purpose, fundamental, and you've got to build that into the front end of the program so you can get them to the next P, which is a pathway. A pathway is a, a way to a goal, a bridge to a destination 
that we design, you don't let the drivers of the cars design their own bridge. Experts design bridges. Who's an expert in curriculum? The student? So that whole shapeless river discussion that's been going on, we've tried to tackle that. Some of you are too, by saying we're going to narrow student choice along pathways to goals that they've helped name once they've established a purpose. And then we're going to stay with them all the way through that. So you've got place, you've got purpose, you've got pathway, and then a student has to have a plan. The plan is how the student makes the pathway her own. A plan has the power of covenant. Without a plan, you are uncommitted. Those of you who have daughters and sons of marriageable age know what I'm talking about. You've got to at least have a plan. A plan's covenantal and it's sticky. Hmm? So, say them with me. Place, purpose, pathway, plan, and then powerful pedagogies. That's a double P. Powerful pedagogies. Colleges all over the country come to us to look at our work and they want to knock off the things we do to see if it will work at their place too and have similar impact. And when I talk to them, about two out of three are doing everything they can to reform student affairs, the business office, financial aid, uh, the co-curriculum. And I said, well, what are, you, what are you doing in the classroom? Oh, well, you know, that's hard. Those pesky faculty. <laughs> Let me tell you something that's fundamental to our future. We all have to believe this. The faculty are the solution not the problem. We have to believe that. And the faculty have to live into that. Be a part of the solution. Okay? The curmudgeon is a 20th century role. Yeah? Get in there. Get involved. Adopt a spirit of inquiry. Share your skepticism. Embrace the people who disagree with you. Stay with the work until we find solutions that, on the basis of evidence, work. And these powerful pedagogies, these high engagement pedagogies, are fundamental. We've put more money and more energy behind our faculty who will run their own professional development model and it is extensive at Valencia. And it's the secret sauce. If you don't change what happens in the classroom, you don't change anything because 95% of the students' experience is in the classroom. So, place, purpose, pathway, plan, pedagogies, and finally, personal. Here's the challenge we all have. Our institutions are big and complicated bureaucracies, and the students are made to feel like numbers and treated as equivalent units of consumption and if you tell someone often enough and authoritatively enough that their real value in the world is a number or a magnetic strip on the back of a card or an FTE, you'll lose them. They know you don't give a damn. They know you're using them. I shared this point in Canada one time. A guy came up to me afterwards and said, you know it's worse here? We don't call them FTEs here. We call them funding units. <laughs> Think about it. When we talk to students, <laughs> it's rolling through the crowd. <laughs> when we talk to students who succeeded, especially the outliers, the ones we didn't expect to succeed, I've done this hundreds of different ways, panel discussions, focus groups. Here's the common answer. What made the difference for you? You know what they all say? We have the best strategic plan in the business. <laughs> Our technology is awesome. Our buildings are beautiful. The librarians are really nice. They don't say any of the, you know what they say? They name a person. 
Ms. Hernandez. What do you mean, Ms. Hernandez? She got me through intermediate algebra. Sometimes they don't know what the person's job is. They just know a person helped them. How do you render deeply personal engagement at scale? This is not just a problem for us. Lunch has got 72,000 students. And we're, we're absolutely fiercely determined we're going to treat each one as a unique human being. It is damned hard and expensive and systemically challenging. There's some ways we're doing that, but I don't have time to tell you about them. Let me just say, our new student experience is the hardest thing I've ever done in my 33-year career in community colleges and the most important, because if it works, every student who comes to us will discern a purpose, will feel a place, will choose a pathway, will make a plan, will experience powerful pedagogies, and will know that to, th to us they're a person. And they'll have a personal guide to take them all the way through their experience at the college. That's what we're trying to design and implement. It's really challenging. No time to tell you more about that. So, You can take those P's, except for maybe the pedagogy, and there's not a role in the college that can't touch that. If you work in buildings and grounds, you can, you can actually have an influence on power, powerful pedagogies if you work in buildings and grounds. You can choose not to mow outside that window while class is in session, right? You could. <laughs> You could fix that room that you could hang meat in because it's so cold. These, these things interfere with pedagogy. Everybody has a role to play. Very often, the person, the student's name, had no business being in their lives. They just encountered them at the college, and they stuck. So here's a, a little poem and then a song, and I'll be done. Is that, do I have enough time to do those, or do you want me to just wrap with the poem? Oh, it's okay. I'm stretched yet. So here's a poem. This is a love poem I wrote to our faculty. It's called Lucky, and the metaphor, of course, is music. There are times I need to pinch myself to prove this isn't just a dream. This work that reaches right down through the rich loam of rhythm and harmony to the roots of joy and shakes the whole tree of my existence with joy and laughter and apprehension that no matter how hard we play, this can't last. Of course, there are times when it feels like going through the motions, not that we're phoning it in, but there just isn't anything happening. The notes are all there in the correct combinations, the right order, but there's no connection, no groove, no conversation, no jazz. But if I keep playing, keep trusting, even the hollow performance eventually serves only to intensify the real music when it happens. And it will happen. When the planets align or the gods condescend or the fundamental particles resonate with the wave of creation. Which is to say, it feels, I feel, so incredibly lucky to be here in the endlessly unfolding work so lucky not to be going through the motions of all the other jobs and careers and options to which I might have been resigned. So lucky to be here with you, who also know the rush when it all comes together. And so lucky to have learned, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Thank you.